Vasilia to Theu, the kingdom of the God, the one God. And then in Hebrew, Malchut Shamayim, the Malchut, the kingdom of the, sh of the heavens, Shamayim. So I think that Jesus was a kingdom obsessed person. And I, I will argue that. We can show from scripture that Jesus loved the kingdom of God. And so I'm going to ask you now, before we go any further, to think for a few minutes. Give me your definition of the kingdom of God. Somebody says to you, Nathan, what's the kingdom of God? What would you say? It's, uh, let me think for just a moment. Talking yeah. Feeling concisely. I would probably say it's, uh, it's God's restored reign that he's going to send back the Messiah, Jesus, and he's going to return the world into its original state. Jackson, did you hear that? If Jesus is coming back, the first definition you're, you're saying of the kingdom of God is a restored state on earth when Jesus comes back. I think that's absolutely right. We could say more things, but that's, that's a very good start. And you were brought up in the particular denomination, the uh, yeah, Abrahamic faith, right? I was, yeah, I was brought up UPC. You were brought up UPC? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So you don't insist on tongues as the only sign anymore? Yeah. <laughs> when I do that, it means, oh, this is great. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. wonderful. Good. Yeah, I was... Well, that's another side, anyway. But that's fair. I did not know that about yeah. you. And you somehow gravitated to these people. I pointed these people. Th these are now deceased people in the Church of God. People who donated money to this college. Mm -hmm. So somehow you came into a Church of God, Abrahamic faith. This denomination, if you want a name, is called the Church of God brackets, Faith of Abraham or Abrahamic faith. They said that because they said, wait a minute, the promises made to Abraham are the kingdom of God promises in the New Testament. That's easy, right? Nothing we do in this class is difficult. I don't believe in difficult things. I think the Bible was written for ordinary folks to understand. We've made it into an argument often. We don't need that. It's supposed to be, I mean, there are technical things, obviously, here and there, but the essence of Scripture, for me, is very clear. Because Jesus was talking to farmers and fishermen who were not able to read, even. So don't tell me this is a nightmare of 38,000 denominations all disagreeing with each other. I don't believe that. So what we get is, is simple and hopefully this will get you through your ministerial life. Help as a contribution to the pastoring work that you're going to do in the future. Okay, this is fascinating. That was an interesting definition. And in your sermon that you preached in the chapel the other day, you mentioned Acts 3. 21, there'll be about a hundred verses you're supposed to absolutely know, like you just know them. So one of them would be Acts 3.21, which says, I'll just recite it for you at the moment. It says that heaven must retain the Messiah, let's call him the Messiah, until the time of restoration of all things spoken of by the prophets. Isn't that brilliant? Is that difficult? No. The Messiah's gone to heaven, ascended, he was resurrected, went to heaven. Now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, which is, where's that from? Where do you get the idea of somebody sitting at the right hand of the Father? What verse is that? Uh, oh, one, ten, one, Psalm Absolutely. 10, one. Psalm 110, verse 1, is a controlling umbrella text for the whole New Testament. Jesus used it. He silenced all of his questions by using it. They use it constantly. It's just a basic, very clear text, like a golden thread running through the New Testament. Very easy. You've got God, and then you've got somebody at his right hand, who is the Messiah, who has ascended there. And according to Acts 3.21, he's gone to heaven until the time of the apokatastasis, which is the restoration <laughs> of all things, and all the prophets spoke about it. Isn't that beautiful? I didn't learn this in church, but I've tried to learn it from the scripture. So that's great, Acts 21. Okay, would you like to share a couple of things about who you are? Yeah, I'm Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist. You are currently a Seventh-day Adventist. Okay, that's very good that I know that. Good, okay, yes. We, Saturday, our holiday is Saturday. Of course. Mine was many years ago too. That's another subject. I, I understand that. I, I love, I deal with SDAs a lot. Yes, good. 
What are you doing in America, though? Uh, we came with my husband and my daughter. Yeah. She was four months old when we came. Yeah. Because my parents are here, so... Your parents are uh, obviously from your from country, America. but they came to America for some yeah, reason. Yeah, my dad came 18 years ago. Wow. Yeah, and we couldn't come or family, so now we are together. That's wonderful. And so your parents, I'm, I'm assuming, were Seventh-day Adventists. Yes, yes. I'll call you SDAs, is that all right? Yes, yes, yes. CV, Church of England, SDAs, UPC, United Pentecostal. I, th yes. This is what we deal with, so we yes. know about that. I have many friends, SDAs. I've been to their meetings. I went to the meeting where they all got together in, in Tennessee and they declared themselves to be Trinitarians. They were not Trinitarians before. Mm -hmm. Ellen G. White. Uh, took them into Trinitarianism effectively, it was a bit, and I have many friends, so I, I know I know the flavour of what you do, which is which is fine. Okay, and so you're taking enough courses here to graduate, or what? What is your plan at the college? Yeah, I, I hope. <coughs> you hope, depending how hard it goes. Yeah. It's good. Is this your first year in the college? Mm, I had one semester. One semester. Uh, mm -hmm. like not last year, but 2014. Okay. Uh, then you took a break for a couple yeah. of years. Now you're back. Yeah, one year I took a break with okay. a baby, so okay. I'm back. <laughs> Spot. Not a great story. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, let me, let me, let me tell you this straight, straight away. We're going to disagree with you very, very gently on the thousand-year reign. Ellen G. White says there'll be nobody on the earth. I want to suggest to you, right, friend to friend, yes, yes. that part isn't right. Okay, I, I suggest. However, now let me agree with you. Sleep of the dead. Marvelous, right? The dead are yes. sleeping. Beautiful. Excellent. But for me, the millennium is teeming with people. So you, you'd be aware of that, right? No problem. No problem. That's great. Okay. And Carlos is filming back there. That's my son-in-law. Okay. All right. So if you have a look then at the uh, program that I gave you, it's called Kingdom of God as Gospel One. This one, do you have that one? Mm -hmm. I want to go through some of this. And all of these are, are the basic ideas then. Course, concept, description, objective, the major issues. I've put simplicity is the key. I just said that, right? Simplicity is the key. We're talking about easy concepts. The Bible is meant to be understood and practical and not just argued about. So beware of a false dichotomy between doctrine and Christian living. Right? Beware of that. People say, oh, I don't want to hear about doctrine. I want Christian living. Now, it makes no sense. Every teaching you do from the Bible is doctrine. Whether we talk about having a good marriage, having obedient children, or we talk about some more abstruse thing, it's all doctrine. But somehow we've created this idea that, oh, I just want to learn how to be a good Christian, but don't give me this stuff about who God is, you see? So that, that to me is a false dichotomy. Teaching is doctrine. So if we talk about who God is, or who Jesus is, that is doctrine. If we talk about being good people, straight, pure sex for life, you know, all of that good ethics, that is doctrine too, so I understand that. Does that make some sense to you? It's not, not difficult. Okay, thousands of commentators, I said here, and, and ordinary Bible readers have noted that Jesus had what they called a magnificent obsession with the kingdom. You understand that, Anna, right? A magnificent obsession, right? Jesus is a kingdom person. So the first thing you can do then in church is to say, is my pastor obsessed with the kingdom? Does he do the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom? If he does, he sounds like Jesus. If he doesn't, <laughs> you, might, you might encourage him to preach, as Jesus did, all about the kingdom. Because in my C of E days, I, I didn't get that clear at all. I, I wouldn't have known what the kingdom of God was, because all I knew was I go to heaven when I die. And now I've given that up, because I believe in the sleep of the dead. Otherwise known as what? CI. What's CI? Conditional immortality is our shared view that the dead are dead. In Georgia, the dead are dead. <laughs> Get it? The dead are dead. That's Georgian, right? Queen's English, the dead are dead. I believe that because then everything depends on the resurrection. See, this is very important. Once you shift the goal to here instead of there, you're shifting the whole narrative. So that is very clear to me, very important to me. Okay, but what is meant by the kingdom of God in Jesus' gospel, the Christian gospel? That's what we're trying to deal with. 
This is the key question in the issue of salvation, which the Bible defines as obedience to Jesus. So these texts that I'm giving you here are ones that I expect you to know for the rest of your lives, because I think they will help you with teaching. But they're not verses that are used, I'm, I'm ad-libbing now, they're not verses that are used a great deal often in preaching. So my concept is, let's do some really easy verses that are clear, like on the sleep of the dead. Ecclesiastes 9.5 says, the dead know nothing at all, period. Isn't that easy? Oh no, they're all up there playing harps or they're being tortured. Under the no, no, no. The dead know nothing at all. That's beautiful to me. But I'm doing this every day on the, on the internet for hours, several hours a day. Carlos knows, does the same. And it's just painful because people will not accept an easy thing. Like right? the dead know nothing at all. This is Ecclesiastes 9.5. And five verses later, it says, there's no activity in Sheol, where all the dead are. Hades, Sheol in Hebrew, Adis in Greek, Hades. That's where all the dead, they're sleeping, they're out of it. And that makes sense to you, doesn't it? Where it's got, you got it from your parents, too. It's marvelous. There's a reason why God sent you here, I'm sure. That's wonderful agreement. Okay, so Hebrews 5.9, let's just look at that one. What does that say? Hebrews 5.9 says, if you've got a, a Bible handy, these are my basic verses for dealing with the whole Christianity thing, right? The kingdom of God is Christianity for me. It's the faith. And these are verses which, for me, seem very straightforward. So Hebrews 5.9, you don't have a Bible with you today? That's fine. Another, another day? Bring yeah, yeah. Yep. You have a New American Standard Version, or what version do you use? New King James, okay, okay. Any Bible will do. I grabbed my Hebrew Bible by accident. Oh, you did? That's all I have on me. Won't matter, you'll have to trust me. I'm not making it up. I'm not, I'm not fooling you. Hebrews 5, 9. What's that? We'll see home if you Right, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, you can check on me. I love this verse. Hebrews 5, 9 says of Jesus that he was made perfect. He was made perfect. So there was a process in the life of Jesus. He was perfected. That's not the main part of the verse. In Hebrews 5, 9, he was made perfect. And when he had been made perfect, he became, to all those who obey him, the author of salvation. The source of eternal salvation, right? Obey him. You know about it. You have a ch child that's old enough to obey Easy word, right? You do what you're told. I don't hear that very clearly in church. I hear, well, it's all by faith. It is by faith. It's all by grace. It's all by grace. That's all true. But there's a little word obedience here, which is very important. So salvation is given to those who obey Jesus. And it says eternal salvation. So the first point I want to make to you is that eternal is not an accurate translation of the Greek. It means the salvation of the coming age. Eternal is, is right. It is forever, but it's vague. It's like saying, tomorrow, let's say in the future you're going to travel. As opposed to tomorrow at 9 o'clock we're going to the airport and you're going to fly to Moldavia. One is clear, the other is vague. Eternal is vague. Now, the top writer that I'll refer to quite often, Tom Wright, Bishop Wright, you've heard of him? He's the top of the line in evangelical scholarship, Bishop Wright. I'm going to appeal to him a number of times. He happens to say exactly what these people <laughs> say, right? But eternal, in his translation of the New Testament, is to do with the age to come. So what you guys are aiming at is the life of the age to come. That's what it means. That's beautiful to me. I've, I've done a translation of the New Testament also. I'll give you one if you want to have one. Some, some week I'll bring it along. Anyway, it's to do with the age to come. Everything is the age to come. So I understand that we're living in the present evil age. What text is that? The present evil age. It's okay, you don't know. I still have a job. If you knew it all, then I can quit. Yeah, That's Galatians 1.4. We'll just mention a lot of verses, but later on we'll try to memorize these. Galatians 1.4. The present evil age. This world is evil. But the age is coming when that evil is going to stop. That's premillennialism. And you are premillennialists too, the SDAs are. There's a slightly different view of what's happening on the earth. That's the difference. You believe Christ is coming back, and you believe in, in a thousand-year reign. 
that we have in common. Okay, so I love that Hebrews 5.9. Salvation is given to those who obey Jesus. That's easy, isn't it? Just want to introduce you to that verse. That's Hebrews 5.9. And John 3.36 says the same thing. I'm going to read to you from John 3.36. And it says this. See if you like this one from John 3.36. Jesus said this. He who believes in the Son has the life of the age to come. But he who does not obey the Son, the wrath of God is hanging over him. Isn't that amazing? There's a contrast in between obedience and not believing. Therefore, a a believing must involve obeying. That's my, that's my point. Very clear. And other verses like it. So that's John 3.36. In fact, I've listed them here. I'm, I'm going to take the time to just go through these verses because you, you'll hear these verses keep coming back. Next one I've got is 1 Timothy 6.3. Uh, let's go there. 1 Timothy 6.3. My suggestion is that this is a good framework for you to study the gospel of the kingdom. 1 Timothy 6.3 has this to say. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with the health-giving words those of our Lord Jesus Messiah, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, godliness, he's conceited and understands nothing. Isn't that powerful? So watch out then, the teaching, obedience to the teaching of Jesus is obviously central. Now you may say, well come on, tell me something original. But you'll find that people don't really know that. It hasn't occurred to them that Jesus might have to be obeyed. Oh, they know he died for their sins and rose. They understand that. But it doesn't always occur to them that we have to do what Jesus says. So that, that's my major point there. That's 1 Timothy 6.3. 2 John 7. I'm going to read it very carefully for you. These are verses which certainly by the end of semester you should know just like, you know, like you know John 3.16. Nathan knows that one. Yeah. Everybody knows John 3.16. Why don't they know these verses? You need to know these verses. You need to go out of this classroom with a hundred verses to answer everybody, talk to everybody about every, everything. Okay, John 3, 16, no, God so loved the world. Actually, the Greek isn't quite that. It's not God so loved the world. It's not wrong. The Greek actually says God loved the world in this way. Just like this. It, it's, it's the same sense, but it isn't quite so loved, right? Isn't that fascinating? It doesn't matter, because that's the same idea. So, like saying, you know, you love your children in this way. Not, you love your children so much that you, it's a slight difference in English. So, God so loved the world, you all know that. But do you know 2 John 7, which says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. And then in verse 9, Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Messiah, Anybody who doesn't abide in the teaching of Messiah does not have God. And the one who abides in that teaching, he has a relationship with the Father and the Son. That's easy stuff, isn't it? So the teaching for John is obviously, and for Jesus, is important. Clear? Okay, that's that one. Now I'll go to John's Gospel, John 12. This is framework, introduction to what we're trying to do. John 12, this is the end of the public ministry of Jesus, right? The rest of John is all about his death. This is the end of his preaching. So what does he say in John 12, 44 onwards? These are such brilliant verses. Your children will love these. You know? Grow up with these verses. They'll say, wow, that's so clear. So John 12, 44, it says, Jesus, he raised his voice, he shouted. He didn't do that very often. He raised his voice on some occasions. One was in the parable of the sower. That's another that's a big subject. We're going to do parable of the sower, right? Sowing the seed, all that. He raised his voice. Here, it says, he raised his voice. He cried out and said, he who believes in me doesn't believe in me. Uh-oh, what's that? 
but in the one who sent me. Can you, can you deal with that? He who believes in me doesn't believe in me. What? <laughs> That's a nice way of saying he who believes in me doesn't ultimately believe in me, Jesus, but ultimately believes in the Father who sent me. You got it. It's a beautiful way to teach. This is John, John 12, 44. He who sees me, Jesus, that is, the one sees the one who sent me. So if you're looking at Jesus, you're seeing God in action. It's clear, right? You're hearing Jesus speak. You're hearing what God says through Jesus. I've come as a light in, into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. 47. This is John 12, 47. If anyone hears my sayings, uh-oh, we're back to the teachings again. If anybody hears my sayings and does not keep them, I don't judge him. I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. He who rejects me does not receive my sayings, my teachings, has one who judges him. The word that I spoke, the teaching that I gave, if you like, is what is going to judge him at the last day. 49. I didn't speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment means the life of the age to come, eternal life, right? The life of the age to come. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Is that difficult? Easy, isn't it? You, you know these verses, right? Yeah. Incredible, isn't it? This is, the fight. this is the end of his ministry, right? And people say, oh, I don't, I don't need the teachings of Jesus. Just, I just believe he died and rose. You see what we're doing here? What I'm giving you here is what these people suggested also, right? The reason I'm teaching in this Bible college is that we traipsed all the way from England because of this book. People suggested some things along these lines to us in England. And from my angle, this sounds right. Now, you can correct me, right? You can say, well, wait a minute, oh, what about this, right? You can. But uh, you're going to have to produce a good argument, right? I see Jesus as a teacher as well as one who died, right? And that's, that's the point, really, that's got these people going. It makes sense to you from your UPC background. Okay, those are the verses then. I will do, we'll do three more. Framework verses for the rest of your life. First Peter 1, 2. In the book of Peter, he says... 1 Peter 1, 2. All right. Um, it's another obedience verse in 1 Peter 1, 2. And it says, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctifying the make holy work of the Spirit to obey Jesus, he says, to obey Jesus Christ, Right, first of all, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled by his blood. That's his death, obviously. So I get this obey word all over. I see this very clearly. It's an easy word. Children understand that. One more um, before we move on. Romans 1.5. Romans 1.5. Again, these are verses which I think will take you through the rest of your ministry for life. And you'll have fun with them. You're going to go to Africa maybe, uh, Nathan. Have you been to Africa yet? Can you raise a little money and when your knee gets better? I, I'm, I was in Africa seven, eight times. Rebecca's been about 24 times. Malawi. I went to Malawi in 1993, on my own actually. And then I went several years. Jim Madison went. And Rebecca's been about, you know Rebecca Martin? That's Joe Martin's, you haven't met her. She's been there about 24 times. Joe's been many times. Malawi, we have groups of people there who like this teaching, right? They find this interesting. So in Romans 1.5, Romans 1.5, and we have the following thing. Romans 1.5 says, Through whom, through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for Paul to bring about the obedience of faith, the obedience of faith, the obedience of faith. The ob you hear that? The obedience of faith. You cannot have faith without obedience. You can't have obedience without faith. Is it clear? These are easy things. Like we're doing mathematics. Two plus two is four. Do we understand that? I don't think in church I knew that. We didn't, we didn't learn these things. And therefore, when we tried to read the Bible, we didn't get very far. When I was in my boarding school, I said, this year I'm going to read the Bible. And I started in Matthew, 
I did begat, begat, so and so begat, 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 begat. That begat's an old English word meaning to be the father of. I got bogged down and I gave up. Now I can sit for hours and read this book. I find this absolutely engrossing and fascinating. It's the only thing that makes the slightest bit of sense to me. So that Romans 1, 5, then the obedience of faith, and he repeats it at the end of Romans 16, this is the last verse we'll do on this. Romans 16 at the end, in other words, you say to your congregations, this frames the book of Romans, right? He begins with it and he ends with it, so it must be important. Romans 16, 26, the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God, which has been made known to all the nations, leading to the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith, the obedience of faith. That's very clear, isn't it? Okay, that point is clear to you? You don't have it. I, I have to download some. Okay. But no, I have a home uh, Bible. Of course. You have a new King James. Yes. Right. You might want to perhaps get a new American Standard Version. We use it, the new American Standard Updated Version. We use it in class. If you can get, you can get a second-hand one. When you buy books, don't buy any books new. Buy them second-hand. Abebooks.com. Most books, two, three dollars, not, not expensive. So if, you, if you're interested, if you wanted to get another, an, an English translation other than the King, the New King James is all right, but the King James is rather old, you know that. Mm -hmm. And some of, the ver some of the verses are not the best manuscripts in the King James. Some, few. So if you get a New American Standard Version, it's, it's good. And if you get one, try to get one with the marginal references, right? Because that's the best inbuilt uh, commentary. It links verses. So when you're teaching your children, jo join the dots. You have a picture with the dots. How old are your children? Uh, three and nine months. Three and nine months. The nine months is not doing this, but three, join the dots, right? Yeah. And make a picture. That's what you're doing in the Bible. You read in Daniel 12 too, it says, many of those who are sleeping in the dust of the ground. It's great to have an SDA with us, isn't it? See, if she wasn't there, she oh, ah. no, she would. Makes her mad. But Ellen G. White taught you this very well, your parents did. So many of those who are sleeping in the dust of the ground will awake, will wake up in the resurrection. That's brilliant. But most of your friends don't understand this. They don't get this right. So I would think this might be true, that if you have this much information on the Bible, small amount, you really have much more than most people have, because they don't know anything much. That's amazing, you, you'll discover that in ministry too. They don't know a lot. I didn't. I didn't know much. Okay, so many of those who are sleeping, that tells you what they're doing, sleeping, right? <coughs> sleeping. Your three-year-old knows what that means. Where are they doing it? In heaven? No. You understand it, but if you were a Pentecostal or some other denomination, you'd probably be, ah! You know? So this is the fascination of religion. Whatever you've been taught, at home tends to be very deeply ingrained, right? So it's a shock when somebody says something, it's a little different than you say, ooh, that doesn't sound right. Anyway, sleeping in the dust of the ground will awake some to the life of the age to come. That's where we get eternal life from. Daniel 12 verse 2, some to the life of the age to come. Forty times in the New Testament that life of the age to come. All of this now you have to teach your people, see. You wouldn't make the mistake and say, oh, I learned that at the college, that's all right, I got my degree. Now I'm going to do real church. Don't, don't do that. Everything you learn about the Bible belongs in your church, right? That's my concept. It's not, this is not academic stuff we do just to argue about the Bible. Heaven forbid. If we're doing that, this is a waste of time. But this works for me. This gives life and energy and a sense of knowing the truth, I think. But we still have to listen See if we, you know, got things wrong. Absolutely. Okay. It should never be above reproach. No, we should always be listening. If you come and say, say to me that you should be baptized four times, head first or legs, or some silly thing, you know. <laughs> oh, okay, show me. Where, where's this? <laughs> Where does it say that? So, um, you are keeping the food laws. You don't eat pork. That, that's it from the day seven. I, I understand. We actually don't anymore, but that's fine. It's, you know, these are differences 
that occur, we still have to be very kind to each other. We have to be friendly and kind. Okay. Okay, that's good. You got the idea? Those are framework verses for the study of the kingdom of God, Jesus' teaching. It's a matter of obedience, clearly. All right, so then, having listed those, and all of those, by the end of the semester, you should know. You should know those verses. If somebody says to you, what's Hebrews 5, 9? Nah, easy. 5, 9 is obedience is everything. Okay. Now, there's been a tendency, I said in the fifth line down, to bypass and thus reject Jesus, i.e. to disobey Jesus when it comes to defining the gospel and the Christian faith. That's a tendency. People, this is me, I'd living now, many people seem to think Paul invented the faith. That's wrong. Paul copied Jesus. Jesus is the founder of our faith. Some people say, oh, Jesus, that was all for Jews. You know, we don't do it. That's, that's fundamentally wrong. Uh, Jesus is the founding father of our Christian faith. And Paul is not disagreeing with Jesus, I don't think. Okay. So, ignoring what Paul actually said, sometimes they do that. And so they pit Jesus against Paul, or Paul against Jesus. That won't work. So that quote at the end of the paragraph there, faith comes by hearing the word of Christ, and that's Hebrews 2.3. This begins with the words of the historical Jesus and continues with the words of Jesus in Paul and the other holy apostles. So for me, the Bible is all one, one book with Jesus being the leader of that New Testament. Yes, I think that I would say, though, yes. um, I have a friend that I talk to, uh, he's a traditionalist, mm -hmm. he lives back home, he's actually taking online classes now, and he'll be attending next fall. That's interesting. I've been, I've been Working with him. For a lot of years now. Very good. And uh, it seems like from between Luke 1 and the Book of Acts and stuff, like you have like a little bit of a changing theology because Jesus isn't necessarily always preaching about his death and resurrection. He's constantly talking about the kingdom of God. Yep. yep. But I think for like, for like Paul mm -hmm. and Luke and the, and the Book of Acts, it then becomes the gospel concerning the kingdom and Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And so, like, I think that's like when sure. people when people listen sure. to Paul and read what Paul has to say, yep. they, they put a lot of emphasis on the the Jesus Christ part and forget the kingdom. Yep. But I think they're both. They're both there. Absolutely right. Yeah, it's a very easy concept. Paul claims to be an apostle of Jesus. It's true that Paul doesn't use the phrase kingdom of God in his letters as often as Jesus did in his preaching. That's true. However, one of the big things we'll do here is look at the kingdom of God in the book of Acts. You know that. Yes. And we'll find that Paul was preaching exactly the same kingdom of God. Now, it may be that since Paul was in danger of having his head chopped off all the time, when you talk about the kingdom and Caesar's listening, you know, you might want to be a little wise and, and talk about righteousness or something like that. That's possible. But he's still talking about the kingdom, especially inheriting the kingdom. Uh, but it's a great point. Well, they were also, yeah. he was also writing letters to established churches, so you yes. think they would have the common faith, the kingdom of God, Good point. and everything else would be more uh, conduct. Absolutely. Yeah, it's probably both, but you're absolutely right. There's a different emphasis. Okay, which is quite different from saying that the teaching of Jesus is for Jews and that's all finished. That's fundamentally wrong. That's out there. It's called dispensationalism, is that Jesus strictly only spoke to Jews and now Jesus speaks through Paul to us. That is absolutely false to me because it gets rid of the teaching of Jesus and that's what you don't want to do. So, good point. Okay, very good. Um, Moving on, then, the third paragraph, I'm on the course program here. It's not possible to know and accept Jesus, is my suggestion. Not possible to know and accept Jesus apart from the gospel of the king. It's very important to understand what Jesus taught, in other words. Jesus, without his teachings, is really in danger, I'm paraphrasing, of being another Jesus. You cannot believe in Jesus and not believe his words. You cannot accept Jesus and not know what he said and preach his gospel. So now I've given you another verse, and that's Isaiah 53, 11. This is a very interesting one. You could, you'll find that in your Romanian translation as well. <laughs> so when they're reading the Bible in your, in your country, Anna, are they reading uh, in, in Romanian yeah, language? Yeah, and they would understand Russian yeah, as well. Hence where you are. Church, yes. Russian church, Russian. Of course, the Russian Orthodox Church. 
Okay, here's a verse. We'll ask you to read it aloud for us in Romanian, just for fun. Just one verse. Isaiah. In England, that's Isaiah. In America, Isaiah. Oh, yeah, I hear N.T. Wright says Isaiah. Isaiah. Well, you're really savvy knowing who N.T. Wright is. Yeah, I, I, I listen to a lot of his podcasts and stuff. He has, a, he has an interesting teaching on compound, uh, compound metaphors and following Wow. He and I have corresponded. He gets still tired of me after a while, but it, we're very close. I mean, but for the grace of God, I, he's slightly younger than I am, but we're from the same sort of uh, British background. Huh? He is younger than you? Yeah. Me? Oh, yeah. Oh, he's that. about 77. Yeah. So I understand him because he's from, you know, I, I would have been at school with him. I wasn't actually in the same school. We, we might well have been. So I understand. He's a brilliant, brilliant writer. Very clever. And I'll give you a handout another day. I don't give you too much of quotes from him. And he's really saying what these people said. Which is interesting. Okay, Isaiah 53 11. Read that for me in Romanian. Just for fun. Just for the camera's sake. What does it say? Do you get that? Yeah. Again, a little bit beyond, beyond this. It sounds like Russian to us, yeah, to our sounds ears. Like sounds like Russian. Use the Cyrillic alphabet, same as Russian? Uh, no. No. Same alphabet as we do. One is Slavic, yes. Cyrillic, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cyrillic, yes. But you don't, you don't. In, in, yes, in, I know. Uh, you know it, yes, but yes, it's... If, if yeah. Of course, of course. But it's not the Romanian. Yeah, it's very clear. Okay, 53.11 says this in English. I want you to get this verse. As a result of his anguish, talking about the servant here, as a result of his anguish, the anguish of Jesus in dying, he will see it and be satisfied, right? It, he, Jesus will say it was worth going through that tortured death. He's going to see the results in your lives and the world, right? I get that. Then he says, by his knowledge, the righteous one, that's Jesus, my servant, will make many right. Justify is a difficult word. If you are justified, you are right rather than wrong, not sinless. By his knowledge, you get it? Not just by dying and rising. This is the main point on which this denomination was founded. That's why I'm stressing. They pointed out this. Yes, we believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Absolutely. Our sins have to be forgiven. In his death. We understand that. But this says, by his knowledge, his teaching, he makes people right. That's a novel idea to many of your friends. They, they haven't thought of that. So it's, it's interesting. But this is great. Is that what you have in your translation? By his knowledge? Yes. yes it's correct. Da'ato, his knowledge in Hebrew. It's, there's no problem with it. So we better be listening to what Jesus has to say, right? By his knowledge, he makes us right. And you are right. You are not sinless. But if you're a believer, believing the truth and living the right life, you are right, not wrong, not sinless. And it doesn't mean you couldn't fall away because that's part of our teaching. You have to maintain the faith to the end. But you're right. Isn't that good? Yes, sir. I was going to ask you a question about justification. Yeah. Because I think that N.T. Wright has a really good teaching on justification. Okay. So like okay. us being justified in the presence is us like accepting the gospel of the kingdom yep. and being baptized in Jesus yes. Christ. Indeed. But truly being justified in the yeah. future yeah. is being resurrected. To Absolutely. I love it. That will work well. You're right at different stages in the game. Yeah. So salvation for us is like running a race. When the gun goes off at the beginning, you begin the race, right? Mm -hmm. You could fall away in the middle. You could. You've got to endure to the end. So I love that. So justification is, being, is, is right. Counted as innocent, if you like. But that innocence has to be maintained. Just like you start the race, you're certainly running the race. But you've got to continue for the gold medal. Yeah. So you say to your children when they get old enough, would you go to the Olympic Games and just watch people start the race? Nah. You're interested in the gold medal, right? On the other hand, you don't, you're not so negative. You're not saying, well, I think I might fall away tomorrow. No. You are right. Right now, you are right. Now, we have to watch us all to see that we stay right. And then we have to be justified finally at the resurrection, which for you and all of us is the end point, right? So we can say this boldly. There's no way out of death 
apart from resurrection. The only way you can come out of death is by resurrection, right? And you don't have to say resurrection of the body because it means that. People say, well, you believe in the resurrection. No, resurrection means the resurrection of a whole person, what we call in English psychosomatic unity, right? So, isn't that beautiful? That's Hebraic thinking, that's the way Jesus thought. But Greek pagan philosophy got mixed up with the faith from the second century onwards and creates the chaos. So our thesis is, because the church fathers, so-called, took us in the wrong direction. That's why Ellen G. White came along and said, no, this pagan immortal soul thing is wrong. We agree with that. It went wrong early on, because the earliest church fathers, Justin Martyr, some of those people, they were strongly Greek philosophically influenced in their previous life. And they began reading the Bible, introducing non-Hebraic ideas, right? Does that make sense? I can't remember who it is. I thought it was Justin Martyr. <laughs> he actually wrote, um, he, something in his writing says, there's a group of people that believe you go to heaven when you die, and these people aren't Christians. Totally. I, th I think it was Justin Martyr. That it was. That, though. No, it was. Yeah. In his, again, uh, his dialogue with Trifo. I've got a, a tract on that. I'll, I'll bring him on. Yeah, Justin Martyr, who, who had still maintained the idea of the sleep of the dead, he said, if you meet some people who say that when they die they go to heaven, don't even think they're Christians. Isn't that interesting? Now, if you say the opposite, you're not taken to be a Christian. Yeah, so. yeah, you're not There's a, a change, right? Either. Right. That's a great point. I'm glad you knew that. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so that's uh, Isaiah 53, 11, about the knowledge. The reason I'm stressing is because you'll hear these verses come, come back, you see. This is the framework that I think will make sense. Okay, so then, um, 53, 11. And I did First John 5.20. First John 5.20, I'll just mention it. It says, by his understanding, you get to know God. By G understanding Jesus, you get to know God. Without that understanding, you're not doing so well. Okay. Jesus defines the saving gospel as the gospel about the kingdom. Now, here we are at our absolute beginning. Mark 1.14 and 15. Nathan has heard this a long time. Which, whose church? Who is the pastor of your church? I've forgotten. Alan. Alan yeah, I taught Alan. He's a great guy. <laughs> I did. Yeah, he's a, the. Uh, you, what is yeah. uh, Jeff Fletcher, yeah. Susan Cain. Yeah. Yeah, Alan Cain's father, Rex, is a great friend of mine. Yeah. He recorded, I did a thing on Revelation about 25 years ago, and he recorded the whole thing before they even thought of these machines. <laughs> We're still sending it out now. Isn't that amazing? Oh, wow. A whole Saturday, I did a whole Saturday, went through the book of Revelation. He recorded all that. In those days, that was pretty. Pretty savvy, you know, to record anything. Now we film everything. It's crazy. Yeah. Okay, so Mark 1, 14. Here you get a drum roll, you know, brrr, da -da, da da Get this one. This is how Jesus began his ministry and how you are going to begin your ministry. Mark 1, 14, 15. After John had been taken into custody. Wow, watch out. A dangerous business, right? You ready to be thrown into prison for this? Because you could be. Quite easily. John was put into the, in England we call it the clink. We'll have a break in just a second. The clink. Jail. That's a British slang. Jesus, his Greek name is Jesus. We use the modern Greek pronunciation. No, language, Jesus. 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 Yeah. It's very close to the Greek. Yeah. The modern Greek pronoun, which we teach in this college, is Jesus, Jesus with a Y, Jesus, and it's Yeshua in Hebrew, or Yahoshua, either one, the long form like Anthony and Tony, Yeshua or Yahoshua, doesn't matter. Jesus, he came into Galilee, what was he doing? Preaching, that means preaching the gospel, heralding, getting a trumpet saying, ta -da, ta -da, listen you guys, Listen carefully. This is the gospel I'm going to tell you. It's about gaining immortality. What's the Romanian for immortality? Immortalitate. I love it. Immortalitate. We have something in common, I see. <laughs> that means you can't die. Yeah. But Ellen G. White taught you correctly, but you can die, but you can be raised from the dead. That's called conditional immortality. That's what we call it in, in theology. Okay, so Jesus came announcing the gospel. Preaching, in fact, the gospel, 
That's the Evangelion, right? In Greek, the good news. Ev is good. Angel is to do with angels. Message. Say it for us. Evangelion. So you've got some Greek words in your language. This is good news. The Russian... Mm-hmm. Russian alphabet looks kind of Greek. I get it yes, yeah. Cyrillic one, right, I can't read that, yes. They do go from left to right. Hebrew goes from right to, right left. to left, right? I'm having a hard time with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, incidentally, how is your Hebrew? What is the Hebrew word for hear, O Israel? What do you call that? You know, with the first command, listen, Shema. Israel, the Shema. <coughs> Did you know that? Shema, S-H-E-M-A, Shema means pay attention. What do you say to your three-year-old? Listen. Shema. Shema. That's what it means. Listen. It's the Hebrew word for hear. A command form. Shema. Okay. So he came preaching God's gospel. That means not good news about God, not good news that there is a God. That's also important, but that's not what he's saying. It's the gospel that comes from God, right? The highest authority in the universe. That gospel, good news from God. And here's the content. Saying, the time is fulfilled. Let's just say it's about five minutes to midnight, about three minutes before we have our break, right? We're right on the edge here. The kingdom of God is approaching. It's not exactly here fully. The, you can taste it, if you like, but it's not ultimately here yet. It's close by. The kingdom of God is coming. And what are you supposed to do? Here's another command. You are to what? Repent. What does that mean? Change your mind totally, right? A new orientation uh, you reorient yourself in England, you reorientate yourself in America. Orientate in America, in England, orient. So the Queen reorients herself. In America, you reorientate yourself. Slight differences. I'm married to a girl from Michigan, so we share differences of language, and we've learned a lot about American English. And you're to repent, and you are to believe the gospel. Is it clear? That's a command. You're to believe it. Why? Because God said it. Tell me, what happened to Zechariah when he didn't believe what the angel said? The father of John the Baptist. Duff, probably deaf and dumb, but, but you know, it doesn't matter. Watch out. Tell your children, if you don't believe what God says, you're in trouble. I have a, I have a sermon on uh, John 3.16 with the word Pistevo, which is the yes. lexical form of... Of course. To, to Absolutely. Believe. Good. And uh, from Dustin and... Mm. Um, I forget what Greek lexicon I got it from, yeah. but like it means to like be trusting, obedient, and faithful to like that one person. Wonderful. So like belief in Greek is a lot stronger. Like we don't have a good American word for it, so it's like being trustful, Absolutely. obedient to, faithful to. Absolutely, and believe it to be true. It means all those things. That's right. Well, that's very good. So you can tell your congregation. We this is the way we operate. You know, uh, Anna comes in and she says she's from, not from America. And I say, well, well, she's lying. She's not. We basically believe each other. Now, sometimes people lie, I see that, but this is the way you establish trust, isn't it? You're to repent and to believe the gospel about the kingdom. If you don't know what the kingdom is, you're in trouble. How can you believe in the gospel of the kingdom? If you, if you think the kingdom is vaguely, I float off to heaven and play harps on pink clouds, you're not believing the gospel. You see, this is what they said. They found it a denomination on this, rightly or wrongly, right? They said it starts by believing the gospel about the kingdom of God. Actually, that makes good sense because that's God's program. To use modern Fox News language, it's God's narrative. I like that word. God's plot, plot line, storyline, right? You tell your three-year-old stories. Don't they? they love stories, don't they? What if they didn't understand the story? It's bad. Many people in church do not know what the gospel of the kingdom really means, not very clearly. So this is where you start. This is what you preach Sunday after Sunday after Sunday until they get it. When you hear them telling other people, then you've won, right? Till they do, you haven't won. When you've got all of your congregation out there at the cash register, uh, you know, at the supermarket, hey, the kingdom's coming. Isn't that exciting? I heard you preach. You were very excited about Acts 321. I've never forgotten it. Wow! The true, it's a very good one. Okay, so you repent and believe the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Isn't that wonderful? That seems to me is the foundation. It's the summary statement. You know, when you, when you do books, you put a chapter heading, don't you? This is the chapter heading over the whole ministry of Jesus. Christianity, in other words, is the kingdom of God message. Now, what does that ultimately mean? You said it right. The restoration of peace on earth. 
Not only that, you're going to rule the world. This may be new to you. God is watching you and saying, hey, I could use this person to rearrange the whole of your country. That's why you're in training. So do we want honest people in that kingdom? You bet we do. We complain about the government now, right? And this stuff in America about the government, isn't it? Fox News, it's all about the government. Who are gonna, who's the honest guy here? You are the executives in training, royal family, for that coming kingdom. So what you do today matters very much. God is watching us. Hey, could I use this person in the king? I don't know, I think he, I think he or she is cheating on the taxes. Ah. Uh -uh. Don't do it. I think he or she is sexually unfaithful. Ah, he's a liar. We don't want him. We want somebody who's straightforward. Now. That, now, that makes good sense. So the point would be then that the talents that God has given us, and you say to your students, you say to your three-year-old, what talent have you got that God didn't give you? Right? Every talent comes from God through parents, DNA and all that. And you, your job is to use that talent now with a view to fixing the world on a grand scale, which to me is a lot more interesting than playing a harp on a pink cloud in the sky. I'm a musician, I'm an oboist. I would have been an oboist's career. I did something else, did Bible instead, but music, my brother was a professional pianist. So <clears throat> music is, is, means a lot to me. And I work at that, you know, I get up for breakfast, I'm playing my oboe, I'm doing my scales and all that stuff. So I'm in training to try to get better. I love that, I love doing that. Like Rora, who loves to sing. You're, you're also musical, I'm sure. So it makes sense. What you're doing today, then, is training to fix the world. There are masters of verses on that. We, we won't do them today. Right? We'll get to it. Now, that makes good sense to me. Check it out. See if that doesn't make sense. Okay, so that was the point there. And then, um, Jesus defines the saving gospel I've got here. Oh, we have a break, don't we? Sorry, you should yell at me. Break time. Have a break. You can be very polite. Okay. Middle of the page, first page here. Kingdom of God is the key to all that Jesus taught. It's also the content of New Testament hope, right? Hope is very important. Without hope, you cannot have real faith and love. Now, I'll ask... You haven't got a Bible, will you? I have, I have one on my phone. Yeah, please, that'd be great. Just to... I get bored with hearing my own voice. Colossians 1, verses 4 and 5. What do you see there, Nathan? This is the New Revised Standard. Perfect. I, I've, uh, I like it pretty well. What do you want, Colossians? Colossians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. 4 and 5. Wow. Read that in clear, good RSV English. Wonderful. But we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Ah. You have heard of this hope before in the word of truth, the gospel. I love it. Okay, that'll be, that'll be enough. That's fine. The faith and the love that you have is because of the hope. So we need to define the hope very clearly, right? It's laid up in heaven. That's to say it's stored up with God. All the things of the future are stored up like treasure. You have treasure in heaven. But it's coming to the earth when Jesus comes back. You see that, right? Good cross-reference be Philippians 2.20. Perfect. Wonderful. Yeah. But notice that the hope is the basis of faith and love. So if you've got a congregation that isn't very faithful and isn't loving, probably they don't understand the hope well. So preach like crazy on the hope, the hope, the hope. Define the hope and you'll be amazed. The love and the faith will increase perhaps. In view of the paramount importance of the kingdom as the heart of the mind, that's 1 Corinthians <coughs> it should be 2.16. Change that to 2, right? If you correct that, it should be 2.16. 1 Corinthians 2.16, change that. That talks about, we have the spirit of Christ, which is the mind of Christ. Same thing, right? Spirit and mind are the same. And the work of Jesus. Along, of course, in black here, of course, including his death and resurrection. We will examine the concept of the kingdom from various angles. In Genesis, in the book of Genesis, it's the promise of a new creation and related to the promise of the land and the seed given to Abraham. Right, so now we're hitting one of the very central doctrines, right? This denomination in which you are sitting is the church of God of the faith of Abraham. 
they said, my goodness, the land promise, the land promise to Abraham. You know who's promised the land, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. The land, the land, the land. Abraham, if you do what I say, if you leave your home and go somewhere, believing in my promises, guess what? I'm going to give you the land, the land, the land forever. He never got it. He died and is dead. Abraham is dead. We can agree on that one. He's dead. He hasn't got the land yet. The QED of that is there must be a resurrection. Right? Now, when you're preaching, you find your neat ways of saying all this, right? You're reading Tom Wright. Yeah. What I do, I learn from other people a lot. I listen to Fox News. They have nice ways, and, and CNN, I listen to anything. They have nice ways of saying, like narrative. That's a good word, right? We're talking about the narrative here, the plot line, the storyline. If you don't get the storyline, it's a big muddle. How many people in England go to church regularly? How many? What percentage do you think? Yeah, 2%. 98% of these people are not looking at a Bible or going to church. They only, you, you may get this, I'll go slowly. They only go to church in England, vast majority, only go to be hatched, matched, and dispatched. Do you get it? Baptized, married, buried. That's a good line. That's a memorable, I've said that all over the world. I've, you know, when you do a lot of public speaking, you'll find the same thing. You've done a lot already. You, you, you get some of these good lines that are memorable lines. So collect the memorable lines that you hear from other people in your reading. It's terrific. Then you'll be more effective as a speaker. Okay, so obviously we're not denying the death and resurrection, which is absolutely central. We're talking about Abraham. I'm not going to read all this, but Genesis, well, not today, another day. Genesis 12, 13, 15, 17, those chapters. It's all about the land, the land, the land, the land, the land. It's nothing to do with about going to heaven. Watch that carefully. In other words, God has not finished with paradise on earth. He tried it, didn't he, with Adam and Eve? What happened? Failed. If God doesn't succeed in having the land, the earth, re-established, he's really failed. That's the problem. So, JWs have us all, the 144,000 are all floating off to heaven. I wouldn't do that. Think of the land. God has not finished with this beautiful earth yet. My wife is a master gardener, Barbara, my wife. Uh, she hasn't had to go out to, to work a job, you know, in that sense. So she's got landscaping at home. And she's very clever at that. She can actually bend over and weed. I can't do that. She can bend up without kneeling down. She weeds the garden, bent over. Like, how do you do that? She's very clever with that. She loves the land. She loves flowers. I'm learning more. I'm, I'm very stupid with flowers. She's a master gardener. And so the land is very special for us. The flowers are amazing. As you get older, you get more appreciative of things, you know. When you're young, nah, less. But now I look at a flower, I think, wow. You cannot make me into an atheist. I cannot believe, even looking at the human eye, you know, the human eye, the human face, personality. Where did that come from? God thought it all up, right? Uh, so you've been well trained by your parents to think of God as real. Okay, reading on here. As the hope of all the prophets, this is the land promise, third, fourth line in that paragraph, and the key to the royal covenant made with King David. Most important, 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7, you must know that, right? You must know the Genesis Abraham story, and you must know the 2 Samuel 7. That's a thousand years later. So think of this. Teach your children this. Abraham, 2,000 years B.C. David, 1,000 years. And then Jesus, right? That's easy. 2,000 Abraham, 1,000 David. David is key. Who is mentioned in the Bible more than anybody else besides God? And the answer is David, even more times than Jesus. David is very important. Not, Jesus is more important than David. We see that. But David is mentioned a mass of times. He's the ideal king. You are kings and queens in training. You're a royal family. You're about to rule the world. Don't you know? I'll throw in a verse here. We've got it over and over. 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Another verse to be memorized. Don't you know the saints are going to manage the world? Are you getting sermons on that? You should be. Don't you know? Have you forgotten? Paul is very upset because the church has a squabble. They have a fight going on. They can't settle their dispute in the church. He says, don't you know the saints are going to manage the world? I didn't hear that in church very clearly. What? Me manage the world? Oh, I can't even manage these papers, you know. <laughs> that phenomenal stuff, isn't it? So that's why I find it a very exciting topic. Managing the world. Fixing the world. Yes. 
thousand years. No, thousand years. No, thousand. One thousand. Oh, but from Adam to Abraham, it's two. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, that's right. That would do well if you want to think of that. If you're thinking roughly six thousand, yes, that oh. would be two thousand. But I was thinking just Abraham to David, a thousand. David to Jesus, a thousand. Right. Oh. Yeah. Before that, you can add another two thousand years. You don't have a th in your language, or do you? Do you have a th sound in in no. in Russian? No. It's difficult for you. You do it well. It's yeah, awkward. Because I studied like this. Right. Interesting. Her English is very clear. Very clear. Yeah. It has to be in the supermarket. <laughs> you go shopping. <laughs> they say, "Where are you from?" Don't they? They say, "Where are you from?" They ask you, "Where are you from?" They do with me. They say, where are you from with this funny accent? I say, I'm from Alabama. I say that all the time. That's ridiculous. I don't sound like an Alabama. It always makes them laugh. Always. I did a Methodist church the other day. I did a speaking in a Methodist church. and I said, you'll have to forgive my accent. It's British. You know, I didn't say it was British. Forgive my funny accent. I'm from Alabama, obviously. And they all just, that makes them all smile. Does the heart good. Okay. You got the idea then. Second Samuel 7, you've got to know that. You've got to know Abraham is in Genesis 12, right? Yes. And you've got to know Second Samuel 7. The new covenant made with Jesus, let's call that the Jesuanic covenant, right? Not the same as the covenant made with Moses. That's important. Not the same as the Mosaic covenant. Some of the things are the same, but not exactly the same. Okay, so covenant made with Jesus which is God's plan for man. I like that. I heard that on, on, on radio somewhere. God's plan for man. Good for the kids, huh? Do you understand? God's plan for man. I like that. God's plan for man. As the subject of many psal psalms, the kingdom is, the bright hope for the future of all mankind on earth. The vision of all the prophets, the framework, too, of the whole of the New Testament scripture. As the center of the covenant made with the international church. Now, I believe we are the international church. I think this will not offend you. We were, these people were very hot on the, on the restoration of Israel, and I am too, I see that. But right now, don't give your identity away, right? We, we tend to go from one extreme to the other. We are the international crowd, God's people now. Doesn't matter what nation you're from. Okay, Joe and I are, you know, one on all this. David is too, but for a while, some years back, that used to be a, a kind of a touchy, okay. hard thing. No need for that. Okay, so more verses there. Um, I won't read all this, except the last line of this paragraph. The shorthand code word called the word of the kingdom. Matthew 13, 19, you must know. That's the parable of the sower. It's called the word, i.e. the word of the kingdom. In Mark, it's called the word. In Luke, it's called the word of God. In Matthew, it's the word about the kingdom. So it's a code word. N.T. Wright gets that right. It's a code word. I don't have to say it to you. When I say word, I don't just mean the Bible. My Georgian, right? I just don't mean the Bible. This is scripture. Within the scripture, you've got the word, which is the word of the gospel of the kingdom. That's absolutely key. It's a code word. It's, it's an in-house word. They knew that. When, you're, when in, in Acts, they're preaching the word. Okay, so Philip goes and preaches the word. First of all, it says he preaches Christ. <coughs> what does that mean? Stood there and said, Christ. Christ. Christ? No. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Then it says he's preaching the word. He's standing there saying, word? Word? No. In Acts 8.12, which is the founding text of these people, Acts 8.12 says, when they preached the gospel about the kingdom and the things concerning Christ. Isn't that brilliant? I didn't learn that in church. It's wonderful. We did very well with that. Okay. Next paragraph. We will survey some modern writings on the kingdom, so very briefly, some of the famous names and discuss the confusing and contradictory views which tend to be presented by scholars. Some of the views, Albert Schweitzer, David Crow was talking about him very, this very morning, asked about him. Schweitzer, have you heard of Albert Schweitzer? No? Famous, not living now, famous doctor and an organist, very fine musician and a theologian. And he said, Jesus was all about the kingdom of God, which is right. Then he, got, he went wrong, he said, Jesus died trying to change the course of the world and failed. Jesus failed? No, he didn't fail. That part he got wrong. But at least he could see that the kingdom was everything to Jesus. Albert Schweitzer, very famous. And then C.H. Dodd, another name. C.H. Dodd said the kingdom is essentially now, 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 nothing in the future. That's wrong. 
Kingdom of God is simply just in your heart now. That's all this is. That's also wrong. We'll, listen, we'll mention those things. Okay. Then a lot more verses there. Saying, saving word. Um, okay. The underlying mistake, four lines down that paragraph, of received, some received traditional systems, is failure to pay attention to Jesus as rabbi and Lord. Do people know Jesus as a rabbi? John 13, 13 says, Jesus said, you call me rabbi and Lord and you do well. The public has lost the sense of Jesus as a rabbi teacher, right? They know he died and rose, that's fine. But they've lost the sense of Jesus being a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi. And he said, you call me rabbi and Lord, and in Georgia you're done good. <laughs> like that. You're doing good. You're doing well. You're doing good in Georgia. You're doing well. So Jesus is a rabbi. He's Jewish. You understand that. Jesus was a Jew. Mary was what? An American? Jew. And Joseph? There are certain things about Jews you're supposed to know. The Shema particularly, by the way. The first commandment. It's like, if I'm from England, I know that the Queen has the British flag over Buckingham Palace. If I said, well, I think she's flying the American flag there, that's silly. All right, what sort of software did Paul have on his computer? You're smiling, but people don't have this sense. This is a Jew. You've got to understand a Jew. I'm trying to understand you in, you know, in your ways of speaking. You're understanding me with my British ways. Of course, this savior of yours, whom you love, the Jesus, was a Jew. Let him be a Jew, for goodness sake. Jews have certain ways of thinking. One is, when you're dead, you're dead. Brilliant, Ellen G. White. Outstandingly good, right? In the churches, no, they're all flying off to heaven. We went to, uh, Joel Hemphill's wife died in the Labrisca. Went to a huge funeral in Tennessee. There wasn't a mention of the resurrection at all. Now, that's because her family don't get it. She, she and Joel understand that. But her family didn't didn't do anything with the resurrection. So resurrection is everything. That's so easy. Your children love that, right? When you're dead, you're sleeping. Okay, got to be resurrected. That's what we're in here. Okay, precious truth there. Okay, now then the last, uh, very close to the bottom of this page. We will examine actual quotations from some evangelical writings. The counter-gospel, I'm calling, a sort of contradictory, confusing thing, of dispensationalism. That means the teaching of Jesus was for Jews, forget it, right? That's fundamentally wrong, which, under, which underlies even a lot of evangelicalism. There's a tendency not to preach from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, right? John, yeah, a lot from John, but not to preach from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. People tend to give sermons endlessly on Paul. Nothing wrong with Paul. But watch your sermons carefully. Are you getting Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Three versions of Jesus' teaching. I think that's the point these people were trying to make. Makes some sense, maybe. Okay. Then, here's a danger. This is five lines from the bottom of page one here. People try to divide the gospel of grace from the gospel of the kingdom, right? So here's a major, major verse for you. Two verses. The gospel of the grace of God is exactly the same as the gospel of the kingdom. Let's look at that on your machine. Could you read for us? Acts chapter 20, please read verses 24 and 25. Acts chapter 20, verses 24 and 25. From Nathan, if you would. <coughs> But I do not count my life of any value to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the good news of God's grace. Got it. Read on. And now I know that none of you, among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom, ah. will ever see my face again. You see how beautiful that is? Listen, I've been to lectures where people have read verse 24, and they never read verse 25. That's amazing. So Paul is saying, I testify, that's what his whole ministry, to the gospel of the grace of God. And as I went about preaching the kingdom, got it? Same thing. Why is that so? Because it's very gracious of God to offer you the kingdom. He's saying to you, hey Nathan, you join my training program, I'm gonna help. you're going to fix the world with Jesus. How about that? That sounds, sounds good, sounds good. That's very gracious. God is kind to us, we're all sinners, we've been forgiven. He's very gracious, but now he says, now let's train to rule the world in the kingdom. That makes some sense. Okay, that's that page one. And now skip 
over the next page and go to page three. Here's what we're trying to do during the course here. January 13th. We didn't get to it yet, but I will give you this article. Have you heard the gospel? I've written too much stuff on all this. Our, our website is just, I mean, ridiculous. My website is restorationfellowship.org. I won't mention it down there. Dan Gill, you know Dan Gill, uh, Nathan, don't you? Nathan, yeah, Dan Gill? Is he in uh, Tennessee? Tennessee. Dan Gill is a former UPC man and believes exactly what we believe. Dan Gill and Sharon Gill, they have a huge website. They get half a million sightings, views every month. So a lot of stuff there, a lot of, a lot of stuff. But um, this one I'll give you to take away to have a look at. What I, what I did here in this little article, have you heard the gospel? I'm being, I'm being a bit provocative. My point is that if you listen to all the Billy Graham stuff, it doesn't mention the kingdom really. It, it, you need to fill that gap in. So 13th, have you heard the gospel is today? An article, which I'll give you. Who are we in the bigger scheme of things? All right, let me deal with that a moment. Who are we, this denomination, is the Church of God Abrahamic faith. From, this, you like this, from 1850, beginning in 1850, there was a huge revival of Adventism. Not only Seventh Day, Adventism, belief in the Second Coming, right? It wasn't preached much. They got their Bibles and they said, my goodness, this is incredible. Everything's about the Second Coming. Adventism. From that Bible study group, there came three denominations, a big one, 23 million Seventh-day Adventists. They said, my goodness, the Fourth Commandment, we need to keep it. That was their view. Also then the Church of God, Abrahamic faith, smaller, and the Christadelphians, who don't believe there's a devil, that's strange to me, they came out of that. So from that group, this college emerges in 1935, this college, in Oregon, Illinois, around about 1930, closed for the war, I think, uh, 1935, uh, around that time, it, it got going in Oregon, Illinois, this college. It was Oregon Bible College. It moved to Georgia in what, 1992 was it? I think so. Yeah, 91, 92. 91, 92. It moved from Oregon, Illinois to Atlanta, it became Atlanta Bible College. So its heritage is Adventist, right? She's an Adventist, I'm an Adventist. Some differences, but you see that? A huge interest in the second coming. Okay, waiting the, waiting the same second coming, right, exactly. And again, I didn't learn that in church. We, nobody ever mentioned the second coming when I went, I went, what was that? All we did was float off to heaven, play harps on pink clouds. Very boring. Okay, at least, I mean, an orchestra, think about this in an orchestra. I get to play in the Peachtree Wind Band every, every week. You play with other people, right? It's fun. So now you're going to sit on a, on a cloud by yourself and play your harp forever by yourself. No friends? You see, the devil has, as we say in England, done a number on people. All right? That's very boring. People say, I'm not interested. I'm not going to church. Who wants to go and sit on a, on a cloud, pink cloud, and play a solo instrument forever? No, thank you. I'll get on with life now. And I come along and say, wait a minute, that's quite wrong. Your goal is to fix the world with Jesus. How would you like to do that? All Americans love to fix the world. You know that. <laughs> Every American, I mean, Brits do it too. But you watch Fox News, everybody's, you know, Donald Trump, oh, you fix the world, right? Whoever it is, fix the world. You all want to fix the world, don't you? You want to fix your family, you want to fix the world. Doesn't it break your heart when people kill each other? You know that in Istanbul, what, yesterday or the day before, about 20 people died altogether, I think. Guy blew himself up. Listen, in the kingdom, this lady gets up one morning, straps a bomb on herself to blow herself up. Stop it. Don't do that. And you'll have the power to stop it. Can't do that now. People are getting divorced. Right, been married 40 years. Got a note from a lady just yesterday. She said, some things have changed in my house. My husband's divorcing me. What? Stop it. Marriage is forever. You can do it with the power of God. You can't do that now, right? You can't stop people now. But in the kingdom, you will be able to make them do it right rather than wrong. And then you'll have a world like you ain't seen nothing yet. So that to me is exciting, it's a lot more interesting. My dad was, was director of naval intelligence, so our whole childhood was, we've got to fix this. How many ships have the Russians got, you know? How many boats or bombs have Americans got? We've got to fix this. That's what dad did till he wore himself out. And uh, so it, as China, you get a lot from your parents. This is what we did. 
And then the Bible, I read in Isaiah 2, you know the passage, it says the nations will beat their tanks into toys. Right? And nation will never, ever, ever have an army again. What? I like that idea. You don't go and train to kill other people. Much less Christians killing each other, by the way, which is a significant thing. In wartime, Christians have killed each other. Even SDAs have killed each other in different countries. Unfortunately. <laughs> that's not a good idea. International warfare involves even Christians. I know that's a tricky subject, but that's going to stop. So that's my vision of the kingdom. And if it's wrong, check it out, you know. Okay. So that's the 13th then. Who are we in the grand scheme? We're Adventists from the 1850s. So we've got some chronology here. 2000 BC, Abraham. 1000 BC, David. Then Jesus. 2000 years on, we aren't there yet. The second coming has not happened yet. It didn't happen in 70 AD. We'll, we'll talk about that in other classes. But it's going to happen in the future. So what is the basis for lordship of Jesus and our obedience? We did the obedience verses. Then here's homework assignment. What I'm asking you to do is to read from this book. You have, oh, you've got one of those, right. Just read the assigned section there. What is it? January the 20th. Please come, having read The Coming King to the Messiah, forward introduction, chapters 1, 2, 3. Read it. Uh, I don't know how much time you have for reading. You have some school time, I'm sure. So read a few pages and, and take a couple of notes or have something to say about what you read. Say, I disagree with that. Or, you won't probably disagree with much of it. Some of the quotes are quite interesting in the early part. <coughs> I'm using my own textbook because there aren't many textbooks on, on this particular thing. But some of the quotes are rather amazing. For instance, on page, let's see, on page... Um, Let's see here. Page t 16. Actually, before that. No, page 14. Let me give you an example. Page 14. I collected these quotes over the years. Somebody called Peter Wagner. You've heard of Peter Wagner, Nathan? Peter Wagner, huge church planting guy, right? Very famous. Okay. Peter Wagner. Belt bottom, page 14. Here's what he said. Let me read the paragraph before. The frank admission of Peter Wagner, I think ought to be a bit challenging, disturbing. It's immensely instructive. He confesses that Christians are not using the language of Jesus. In his book, Church Growth and the Whole Gospel, Peter Wagner cites George Eldon Ladd, his very famous guy, he's dead now. Joe and I visited him just before he died. George Eldon Ladd. He says, the modern scholarship is quite unanimous in the opinion that the kingdom of God was the central message of Jesus. I get it. Then Wagner says this. He's a big church planting man, Wagner is. If this is true, and I know of no reason to dispute it, I cannot help wondering out loud why I haven't heard more about the kingdom in the 30 years I've been a Christian. I certainly have read about the kingdom enough in the Bible. Matthew mentions it 52 times. Mark 19 times, Luke 44 times, and John four times. But, this is Peter Wagner speaking, I honestly cannot remember any pastor whose ministry I've been under actually preaching a sermon on the kingdom of God. As I rummage through my own sermon barrel, I now realize that I, Peter Wagner, have never preached a sermon on the kingdom. Where's the kingdom gone? I'm saying, I just heard, do you, see, do you hear what you just said? Jesus always preaches the kingdom. I've never preached on it. What? Something is strange. And that's why I think the Adventists said something's wrong when we don't have the second coming, right? And got 23 million of you together. I went to the meeting in Tennessee where they all became uh, Trinitarians. That was, you know, part of what they were meeting. They had different views on that. They're very sweet. I, I, I said to them, I, I believe in the sleep of the dead. I agree with you on that. Sleep of the dead, you know, it's wonderful. So we made friends on that doctrine. But they're 23 million. They have amazing Bible colleges all over the world, SDAs do. They're massive, you know, huge, huge thing. In Malawi, they have one. So I, I've met lots of Adventists. But they said, look, we never heard about the second coming. So they rediscovered it. So those quotes are interesting. 
So if you'd follow that, then we have about five minutes to go. Read that and come back next Wednesday and read that section. Come with some sort of writing, if you would. I mean, some notes, half page, page, something just to show you've reacted. The other thing that would be fun to do is to engage somebody on a blog. Do you, do you ever do that? I've done that before. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if we can ask our mother of two children to do this too, but try to engage someone in conversation about the kingdom of God on the internet, or if you can, or your husband, whatever, talk about the kingdom so that you keep this alive and find it interesting. Okay, you see what we're doing then? By the end of the semester, you will have all these verses. Hebrews 5, 9, you know that. Salvation comes to those who obey. John 3, 36, those who obey Jesus are doing well. Those who disobey and disbelieve are doing badly. I get it. Easy things. Abraham, 2 Samuel, that whole plan, that whole storyline, I hope you'll have it for the rest of your teaching life. And your children will love this, you know. Your husband will love it too, I'm sure. He'll find it interesting. And you're not forced to believe anything. If you want to write something different in your papers, you know, it's fine. You can argue. You're not forced to believe anything. This is what we as a group sort of have believed for a while. Okay, then uh, let me give you one. This is, this is for your background information. Just keep those. That, that's, that's my gift to, to remember. And the Our Father's book, I believe you have that as well. You have that.